recording this session, but we were the only ones recording. Please do not record anything. Uh, for the panelists only, please remember to mute your microphones when you're not speaking and reduce your background noise and disrupt you, so we don't disrupt other speakers. Thank you all so much. So that's uh, some of our ground rules for today. Um, so I'm assuming Fatumata is not back. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to suggest we start. Uh, Fatumata, it's uh, one of our frontline activists who is from Senegal. Actually, we had Rachel from AMREF who was going to translate for her. And actually, we went through all, her question, all the questions with her yesterday. So in case Fatumata does not get any internet, I'm going to ask Rachel to briefly this uh, update us on, on, on the questions that she answered. So at this point, I'm going to ask all the panelists to turn on their cameras, uh, if you may. Thank you all so much. And I'm going to pass it over to our team lead, Rosalind, to welcome everybody. Rosalind, over to you. Uh, thank you, Leila. Um, and um, I want to take this opportunity to um, welcome you all to this very exciting webinar, the first one that we are having as the support to ALM team uh, with uh, people who have a passion uh, to end FGM globally. Uh, so I know we are from different parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from and compliments of the new year. The year is still young, we're just in February. Um, um, it's, it's quite an honor for me to be able to join um, everyone else during this webinar to discuss the impact of COVID on FGMC and allow me to thank each one of you for accepting the invitation and overwhelmingly attending this virtual meeting, especially with the prevailing COVID situation. It's not easy. We all have to go through a lot of meetings, online meetings, webinars, um, Zoom, Teams, something we had to quickly learn uh, in the last few months. And we realized that even with that, the world is still going on. So we are grateful that we have this opportunity to have this conversation globally. And this is going to be one of the many conversations that we'll have as people who are interested in the end FGM agenda. Uh, I also want to thank my colleagues um, on, the, on the Support to LM Consortium that has many partners. There's options as the prime. We have Amref Health Africa, ActionAid, Kit Project, Shudas, Africa Coordination Center for Abandonment of FGM, Stroke C, uh, University of Portsmouth. I want to welcome you all to this meeting. This has been quite a lot of work that we've done together. It's happening today. We're going to see how we move this global agenda because it's an agenda that doesn't end with one conversation. Uh, one thing that we believe in as a program is putting the girl at the center. And I'm sure that even as we discuss, uh, we'll not lose track of that vision of putting the girl at the center and making sure that we provide her an environment where she is able to thrive, she is able to grow, and she's able to have bodily autonomy and is free from all forms of violence, especially um, child-related child violence, violence against children because children don't have a big voice much, and don't have much. a platform where they can voice what they are going through. So at this juncture, I want to recognize the attendance of the minister, of Minister Wendy Morton. Please feel welcome to join us in this meeting and be excited that you're participating in this. Fatuma Tatamba from Senegal, uh, if she's finally able to join us, if she's not, we'll also get to know what she wanted to tell us. Um, uh, Natalie from Kenya, uh, Dr. Mariam Dahir from Somaliland, and my colleague uh, Leila, who will be leading the chairing the discussions. And I hope that we're going to have very fruitful deliberations and that we all are going to share a common vision to make sure that we push the FGM agenda forward and that no girl is exposed to this risk. Um, thank you so much. And back to you, Leila. Thank you so much, Rosaling. In the spirit of, you know, be, this program being a girl centered and having all female panelists makes this even more exciting. So I would like to really acknowledge that. And Fatimata has joined us. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> so let I think it's important we kick this off and I would like to welcome uh, uh, Minister Wendy Morton 
to give us a keynote to really uh, start off this conversation. And then I'll come back to the panelists to update us on a few things during COVID-19. Uh, Minister Wendy Morton, over to you. Thank you, Leila. And uh, good afternoon or good morning to, to everyone. Um, I am really pleased to be here today with you and to be marking International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. I recently took on responsibility for the FCDO's work on FGM and I have to say I'm really looking forward to working on such a critical issue. But firstly, I want to pay tribute to the work that you all do as activists and leaders towards ending FGM. Um, thank you, Leila and colleagues, for creating this opportunity for me to learn from you as well. I'm here today to show my support and to understand the realities with which you are grappling. The facts about FGM speak for themselves. We know that millions of girls continue to be at risk each year and that COVID-19 has exacerbated these risks. It's a sobering picture and ending FGM has never been more urgent. But we know that change continues to be led from within affected communities and countries, a result of the inspiring work of activists, including yourselves, and progress is being made towards the 2030 goal. I'm proud of the role that the UK government has played to support the Africa-led movement and to accelerate the pace of change. The UK is a staunch defender of sexual and reproductive health and rights, and we have not been afraid to stand up and speak out when these rights are being abused. Since 2013, UK aid programmes have encouraged over 10,000 communities to pledge to abandon FGM. We've supported the girl generation and invested in efforts to change laws and policies and the health sector through the UN Joint Programme and the World Health Organization. Our programmes have helped over 4 million girls and women to receive health, social and legal services related to FGM. We've supported doctors, midwives and nurses in helping to end FGM and care for survivors. We've worked with several countries across Africa to help strengthen their laws and make the practice illegal, including through our long-standing support to accelerate the end FGM movement in Sudan. And we're very pleased to be partnering with, partnering with many organizations and individuals here today through our current phase of support to the Africa-led movement, which is in its early stages. As we continue to shape our approach, we need to include and stay connected to the activists and the communities that are leading the change. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today. And as I said, to listening, to learning, and to understanding how we can all act together to end FGM. Thank you. Just realized I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy, uh, uh, for, for, for those words. And I think really recognizing the frontline activist, uh, especially in such difficult times, uh, uh, it's extremely important that we not just saying it, but we also show solidarity. And hence why, you know, really we, we have this panel. And I actually would like to start hearing from Dr. Marion, who's based in Somaliland. So Marion, in a few minutes, if you can just give us an update on how COVID-19 has had an impact on the work you've been doing, you know, in Somaliland specifically around tackling FGM. Thank you, Dr. Leila. And I'm honored and pleased to share the panel with, Dr. with Minister Wendy. And I am really excited that I have another panelist that we can learn and tackle this kind of uh, and practices in our communities. You know, in Somali community, who, women, even women themselves even see this FGM, this practice as a honor, as a something that clean and good that they need to pass to become a woman. So as a victim, I have been and also an advocate and activist who, who I have been in a, in a side or they, are, they put me in a corner that say, why you, are th why you are speaking about your thing and everything. So I'm happy that we are having women who are also from Somali community that speaking up this kind of, a, act and this kind of horror, horror and horror that women are living with. As a medical doctor, I have seen a lot of cases in my medical work. And when I was an intern, also in a, a clinician, that's time I started to actually speak up 
to prevent women from fistula, from the FGM complications and everything. Coming back to the COVID-19 and lockdowns, and as a chairperson of youth and FGM in Somaliland, we were based and our work was, do, was more on movement, like going to universities, teaching and educating young people and reaching out to communities in the rural area. But in the COVID-19 era and the last year, we haven't done any work because the universities was locked and closed and the schools were closed. We couldn't find any funding to go to the rural areas. We have here many cases that happen, and especially nurses and midwives were doing cutting in the homes. Uh, so they were going like, they were not having any much work. So, and the people like uh, now the anti-medicalization um, uh, trend in Somaliland, there is a lot of like uh, increases from 20 to 50 um, that the women prefer that they, their girl is to be cut by, by professionals, by health professionals, because it is clean, it is safe, and something like that, what they say. So they were calling midwives and nurses to the homes, and then the, that kind of practice were happening. And we hear, but we couldn't find anything to do because we couldn't go anywhere, and all the funding were moving to COVID. So even if we were asking universities and NGOs and all and anyone who is wanted to fund, they were saying like we have we have other things to do like COVID, like hand washing and all of that. And I am aware that was very important, but we miss one point: girls. Girls were in their homes and safe. We locked the schools. That was escape. The girls were escaping from everything, from harm, from from STP fee, all the forms of STP STP fee. But we locked down, and we closed their schools. They were not even getting get. They were also getting off married because they were staying at home. We have now seen many drop case, many drop um, dropouts. So the the impact was huge, especially those who are activists. I needed to reach more and we couldn't. So we really need to be more proactive if we need to have more uh, to save our community and also girls. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Mari. I mean, you know, for those of you who join, you know, the, the current statistics clearly say every 11 seconds, a girl will be cut. This is a pandemic itself, and we must really see it as that. And 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 it's quite scary. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Marin. I want to come to uh, Fatumata. Um, so Rachel, you're going to help us make this translation. So I'm asking Fatumata basically the same question: How has this had an impact in the work that she's been doing in Senegal? Fatumata, oui. C'est bon, tu peux mettre ton caméra okay. ok. Bonjour, bienvenue. Bonjour. On est ravis. Bonjour. Euh... Ah, c'est moi. <rire> on est, on est ravis <rire> de t'avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui. Euh, c'est Fatoumata. Ah, pareil, moi. Uh, uh, sorry. Fatoumata est un uh, activiste dans la Seju region du Sénégal. Um, and she said she's delighted to be here today. So, Leila, your first question was an update on how COVID-19 has had an impact on the work that she's doing specifically in tackling FGM. Mm -hmm. Ok. Mm -hmm. Donc, euh, alors, la question, c'est comment est-ce que ton travail a oui. changé depuis l'arrivée du virus? Donc, euh, quels sont les enjeux, les défis auxquels tu fais face depuis le début de la pandémie? Euh, bonjour. Bonjour à tout le monde. Bon... Bonjour à tous les panélistes, tout le monde. Euh, c'était un peu compliqué parce que euh, pour moi, euh, c'était pas facile parce que nous, notre approche, euh, c'était euh, communautaire. Il fallait euh, approcher les gens pour mieux les sensibiliser. Du coup, avec, euh, avec la COVID et, la, et le respect de, de la distanciation, c'était un peu compliqué. Ce qui a fait que il y a des exciseuses qui ont profité, profité de cette situation pour essayer de faire euh, exciser les enfants sans qu'on qu 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 est au courant. Parce que nous, euh, on n'a pas, on n'a plus accès, euh, on ne peut pas descendre sur le terrain, 
ce qui les a un peu euh, fortifiés. C'est ça. Mais après, on s'est aussi euh, profité de ça pour essayer de faire des sensibilisations à la radio, essayer de parler avec les gens à la radio, comme il n'y avait plus de l'école. L'école qui était, nous, notre... Euh, L'école qui est notre porte d'entrée, mais il euh, n'y avait pas de l'école, mais on s'est euh, accentualisé sur les radios communautaires pour essayer de... Pardon, je vais traduire cette partie-là et ensuite tu continues. D'accord. Bon ok, okay. c'est bon, ouais. bon. Merci. Donc, pour tout ma tâche, pour elle, c'est aussi très compliqué et parce que leur approche à ending FGM est très... Much community-based, community-driven, and so the kind of channels and forums that they relied on, much like um, <clears throat> in other countries, has have really been closed to them, and particularly schools, um, which were the sort of access gate um, that, 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 that they relied very heavily on to girls, and then through through the girls to their families, um, the, the schools have been closed. And so she says that they really had to, um, and as a result, um, girls are much more at risk Uh, cutters have taken advantage of the situation to cut more girls um, and in a way that, that isn't sort of heard about or spoken about um, and so it's been very risky. So what they've done, she says, is um, adapt their approach um, and they have pivoted um, to community radio and um, to uh, pass those same messages um, to the community. Alors, Fatoumata, pardon, si t'avais pas fini, vas-y, si tu veux continuer. Ouais, c'est ça. Comment vous avez fait pour adapter votre travail Ouais, ouais. Après, euh, après ça, nous, on a essayé de voir, euh, parce qu'on croyait que c'était pour euh, un laps de temps, ça va finir, vu que ça n'a ça, euh, ça pas fini jusqu'à présent. Du coup, on s'est dit qu'il euh, faut qu'on essaie de voir euh, des nouvelles stratégies à, 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 à prendre pour essayer de sensibiliser, de continuer à sensibiliser. Donc, ce qui est faisable, quand on avait des relais partout, les enfants étaient là euh, dans leur famille. Après, on a essayé de travailler euh, par Zoom pour essayer avec ces relais de voir quelles sont les formations à faire, quelles sont les réunions à faire et quelles sont les, 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 les démarches à prendre. On a essayé avec euh, ces filles de les sensibiliser, de les dire de ne pas euh, laisser comme ça. Bien vrai qu'il n'y avait plus de partenaires, il n'y avait plus de moyens de descendre, sur les, qui, euh, de descendre mais il y avait des radios communautaires qui étaient là, qui étaient prêtes à nous accompagner. Donc, euh, il fallait essayer de faire ça et aussi de sensibiliser à la maison, de sensibiliser leurs parents, leurs pères, de leur, dire que, de leur parler de l'exclusion et les conséquences de l'exclusion. Euh, C'est ça qu'on avait fait. Et on avait profité aussi euh, en distribuant les, les, les alcozels, euh, les dons qu'on faisait, comme on avait fait beaucoup de dons, des, 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 des masques, euh, des gels euh, et tout. On, 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 <rire> il fallait profiter aussi de ces situations pour okay. essayer aussi de sensibiliser aussi. Ouais. Alors, ça. Je, vais essayer, je te coupe, pardon, parce que je vais essayer de traduire cette partie-là. Traduire, c'est ça, oui. Je ne ouais. vais pas me souvenir de tout. <rire> ouais. um, So uh, she says that, yes, a lot of the meetings that they ordinarily would have had um, in face-to-face -face settings and um, they have had online <coughs> and on Zoom, um, they've relied very heavily on community radio and they also took advantage of um, the distribution um, of hand-washing uh, facilities and masks and uh, so they've actually integrated their end FGM work and awareness raising into um, the uh, COVID response that they've been carrying out because that creates an opportunity for those same conversations. Um, and she says, basically, they realized that they've had to think carefully about new strategies because there's no end to the pandemic in sight. And so this is the way they're going to be doing things for, for the foreseeable. So sorry, that's, I've slightly shortened it there, but yeah. OK, merci Fatoumata. On va passer à la prochaine. Mais on, on revient vers toi après. D'accord, OK. <laughs> You're on mute, Leila. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I was saying I, there's a there's a common. I didn't put my hand up. I don't know why. I can't lower it down. Um, yeah, I say I, I can see the common thread that's happening between Fatumata and Mariam in terms of using other, trying to find other, you know, 
placing yourself in. And, and this is the creativity of activists all the time is finding that creativity and how do you ensure nothing is missed out on. So thank you so much for that, Fatima. Natalie, uh, maybe if you can briefly tell us how this has had an impact on you as well. Um, good afternoon, Leila. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm speaking, I'm coming in from Kenya and I'm glad to be in this uh, event today and also to meet Dr. Mariam. I think this is the second time I'm meeting her and, and possibly I think it's Leila who brought us together. So and I'm always inspired by her and also the opportunity to meet um, uh, the, the minister, uh, Wendy, and also uh, Rosalind as well. So and I'm also, I can relate to um, what uh, Dr. Mariam shared and also what Fatumata shared. Um, but for me, one of the things that really um, immediately, immediately we learned that we're going on lockdown and everything is going to stop. Um, one of the lessons that actually came a, a, few, a few months in, like two months in, was the realization that what COVID did was just to, to bring it to our faces, that girls have been suffering all along and we need to do better as as you do know, as 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 as, uh, as government and as as uh, mostly as government because the responsibilities sometimes lie hugely on government and one of the things for us is that unfortunately we didn't we couldn't we couldn't lock our offices we couldn't lock ourselves in we had to be out in the field and it's because um immediately immediately um COVID hit and everybody was asked to be in. We knew that almost 90% of our girls are not safe in some of the spaces they are in. Some of the only safe spaces they have is the maybe uh, six hours they're in school or for those who are in boarding school, being uh, in boarding school. But for most of them, and even evidence show, uh, was able to show a couple of months in is that most, most girls and women were actually living in places of isolation. And in these spaces where the abuse happened, they were not receiving any help. So what we did is that immediately we learned that, um, you know, all the people who are in need of help, if we locked our offices, like everybody else has around here, we know, you know, where are the girls going going to go to. So we remained open. We've remained open throughout. And another thing we decided to just like uh, what um, the, Dr. Mariam and Fatumata were talking about is that we had to still find a way to reach the most isolated girls. And you know, the one thing we did is that we knew that if, if we went at home and spoke about FGM um, or even child marriage, or wanted to find out if the girls are at risk, maybe we could not be accepted or the reception could be negative. So what we did is that we were doing menstrual care, um, uh, you know, provision of menstrual care to the girls. And this was part of, uh, it included a menstrual uh, care, uh, you know, product. And once we meet the girls and we talked about menstruation, some of the things or some of the conversations you'd be able to pick up girls who are at risk. And from that, we're able to pick out girls who are at risk of FGM and girls who are at risk of even additionally child marriage and be able to refer them. And when um, what another thing also that happened is that due to the to the uncertainty and to the um, um, even loss of economic uh, you know loss of economic uh, income. For most of the families, it increased the number of girls who are again in, at, at risk of FGM. And when, uh, when, when it got to October, November, which is normally traditionally not a cutting period, this time round, the community decided to meet late girls. And the one thing we saw is that within a period of four weeks, more than three thousand girls were mutilated. And that is uh, that goes against what has been initially. Um, and we have never seen such a huge number of girls being cut within such a short period of time. And that can be attributed only to to all the things that came before. So girls being in isolation and of course uh, them being out of help and we couldn't reach all the girls. And and for all, for everybody who, you know, um, the spaces that girls are able to be brought together um, to constantly find help were locked out and even support came in later on when a lot of noise had been made and unfortunately a lot of girls had been cut. But the beauty is that some of the people identified that there was a problem and um, like for instance, we, we as local partners were able to still lobby and keep girls safe despite that not being, a, a, you know, government not, not having given a directive, but we asked that 
all these girls, if you're not able to take them to somewhere that is safe, uh, they're going to get cut. And we're happy that almost out of all the girls who um, were fleeing from FGM, more than 100 and, and almost 200 girls were able to be safe, were able to be kept safe. Another thing that we have increasingly done similarly to um, to what has been done in Somaliland and, and in Senegal is also utilizing other means of, you know, mainstreaming or, or, or including F, uh, messages to NFGM in other things. So for instance, hand washing, um, COVID, COVID um, awareness messaging, and also just utilizing platforms like radio to constantly have a dialogue with the community. Thank you so much for that, Natalie. Uh, are the, uh, just a, a quick thing, at the beginning when uh, COVID started to happen, there were lockdowns. We created a support line for all of us to log in each week just to check in. And it was really shocking to hear every week, 80 girls, 70 girls were being cut. And really, uh, again, you know, all three of you reminding us how important this is. But I think also, Natalie, you touched on uh, the point about, you know, having that political uh, uh, will. And, and I, and I want to come back to Wendy, actually, with this question, you know, I'm very proud of my country, the UK, you know, we made one of the biggest uh, 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 donations towards this work. But I just want to, my question would be, uh, the UK government obviously is one of the uh, earliest major donors to fund and scale up uh, and make the effort in breaking the silence around FGM. So what has the UK done and learned from since the GEL summit in, 2000, uh, uh, in 2014? And how has this informed, how has this approach is informed now? Like, would you able to, touch a little bit on that for us in a bit yeah absolutely Leila. i think it's a really good question um and you know the girl the girl summit was a decisive moment mm. in in breaking the silence on fgm as well as on child marriage um and since then uk aid has supported programs um at what sort of the uk aid supported programs have helped build the girl generation which i know many of you uh, may have have been yep. involved in, and I think you're yep. nodding there. I think Leila, you could possibly be been involved yep. in, in, in <laughs> yes. that too. Yep. Um, but and so we've continued to invest in in the UN and the World Health Organization, um, and also in, in research, which, combined with the groundbreaking work of in, initiatives like Salima, has generated that critically important evidence. Um, and I think you know we know so much more now than we did back in 2014. Um, we know that change is possible. Um, we know that laws are necessary, but they require social legitimacy to be effective. Um, so engaging, listening to, supporting activists and communities is all essential to, to changing attitudes towards FGM. Um, you know, and we've learned, we've learned more about um, what our role as the UK government should be in all of this too. Um, and we know that, that we need to accelerate community and country-led change. Um, and we know that, you know, to, um, well, actually, we've, you know, we've worked, sorry, we've, we've, we've worked with, um, you know, with, with, with various countries um, a, a, across Africa and um, to help strengthen their laws and to um, make the practice illegal, um, including through our long-standing support of, to accelerate the end FGM movement in, 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 in Sudan and, you know, so you know, I think there's a lot of areas that we have been working in, and and we know that um, that to do so, we we really do need to take a multi-pronged approach to to our support. Um, just another follow-up question. Obviously, mm. um, how will FCDO, you know, continue to support this work, but also you as a minister, because you know, from my experience, when you have a minister really advocating, you know, being the person at the forefront makes a massive difference. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how that, how will you take on this role? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, ending, ending violence against women and girls is a centre, is a core part of, of the government's mission. And also really important is my work here in the FCDO um, to, to advance gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And against, you know, against, against the backdrop of the of the terrible COVID nineteen pandemic, this work is absolutely more important than ever. Um, and so, I, I intend to use my position to champion these issues, and that includes zero tolerance of, of FGM and all forms of violence against against women and girls. Um, the UK has supported um, pioneering approaches 
um, that have demonstrated very clearly that violence is preventable. Um, and we're, we're really pleased to be building on this work and continuing to use our voice on the world stage to shine a light on the issues. I think that's something that I can, that I can, I can really help with. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really glad that this year we'll co-lead the gender-based viola viol violence against a, a violence action coalition, is that right? Um, alongside Kenya and others as part of the UN Women Generation Equality Forum. Um, and and we're, 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 using, we're using this platform to drive more concerted um, and, and increased action across the whole international system on gender-based violence, including, including FGM. Um, and I think the other important thing, Leila, is that we, we also intend to use the best use of our G7 presidency um, to spearhead um, international action on gender equality and the rights of women, of women and girls. And, and I think these are just some of the um, really important opportunities that we have this year in 2021 um, to advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights and ending violence against women and girls. Um, and, and I think we need to use those, those opportunities, but I would, I would really like to hear more from, from you uh, as well, to hear uh, uh, you know, about the opportunities that you see and, and how, can, how can we work together on what I, what I see as being a really vitally important agenda. So I'm passing it back to you, Leila. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, for me currently, uh, and this is why for me it's been so important, you know, to have these conversations, not just now on Zero Tolerance Day, this has to be continued uh, conversations, especially uh, I know uh, my colleagues and I at the Africa-led movement, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of is when we were setting out our work plan, we actually went and spoke to the activists first. Mm -hmm because we said this work plan cannot be developed unless you have an input. And actually Natalie and a couple of others were part of that conversation. So we're doing that in Kenya. We're gonna be doing it all the other countries that hopefully we're gonna be working in. So I'm this time, this position I'm in now, I'm gonna be led by the activist in Africa. And I think that's, and, and that's absolutely uh, uh, key to this. I wanna give the opportunity for people to ask questions. So I'm gonna ask my colleague, Nancy, who's watching all the comments. So Nancy, if you unmute yourself, is there any question or maybe some comments you wanna read out to the panelist? Um, so thank you, Leila. Thank you all for um, such an exciting discussion we are having. Uh, we have a number of comments uh, uh, from the chat room here. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have uh, colleagues from Kenya who are uh, updating us that they have some work happening and they've just left their contacts there. Another uh, comment is that um, this is such a good example of how grassroots activists find solutions during crisis. Uh, and they say, thank you for sharing. Another one uh, is that um, it's good to be piggybacking on COVID uh, response, uh, and that is another brilliant work. Uh, perhaps I'll go to the first question, Leila, mm -hmm. um, and the question goes, uh, or um, you can um, answer it, um, that the question goes, um, the structured um, work within the communities, uh, at this point, how are communities and groups and leaders uh, working together to ensure that uh, they're still responding uh, to the FGM pandemic alongside the COVID-19. So um, just to refresh again, the question is, uh, how are communities, champions, group leaders, mm. groups and leaders working at local level uh, to ensure that there's still dialogues at a, a community level? Maybe, Mariam, do you want to give us an example of, because I know, I, by the way, I encourage you all to follow these activists. Mariam's uh, Twitter feed is quite interesting. You know, she's not just tackling FGM, she is tackling laws and policies that discriminate against women. So maybe, Mariam, maybe that question, how, how are you approaching this with, obviously, uh, uh, other ac um, actors in, 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 in Somaliland? Thank you, Ms. Leila, because the, the things that are happening in my community is huge and I really have a voice. So I use whenever I have opportunity to say what is right, especially women participation in political parties and political positions, because if we were, to, if we were not have Wendy as a minister, how we can speak about this kind of issue. So that's why I actually advocate in Somaliland government to have a woman in the decision making table, at least to see because in Somaliland, we don't have law still criminalizing FGM. 
the STB pillow or sexual offensive pillow is being uh, hanging or is being suspended. So we have a lot of things that's going on. That's why I'm always on Twitter and also on Facebook. And the things that we really work on is the how we can engage the young people and young, young women and make collisions on Facebook and also on Twitter and Snapchat and everywhere that we can use and we can reach more uh, girls. And, and I know many of many of you, Somalis, are many on social media. So using that platform is really, really helpful. And that's how we are surviving. Coming back to the how we are continuing to dialogue is we really working on an act, as an activist uh, wherever I go, I speak to the women who are in the grassroots. In Somali community, women always come together and discuss and talk when they are fetching water, when they are cooking, when they are cleaning, and when they are in the fender, straight, straight fenders. So we are uh, working together with women to speak to each other and actually get more role models who are abandoned FGM and also not cut their girls or are not even willing to cut their girls. So we have certain role models to, to work with other women in the in the communities and speak to each other. So really the change maker is are really those women living in a far remote areas, but still they have the momentum to, to talk to, the, to their leaders as well. So what we are missing only is the women, is the men and also the main leadership to see this kind of uh, and harmful practices are harming women and speak to about it. So we are working with the youth who are men to speak out and also work with their fellow leaders and also old elder men and have this kind. This is areas that we really need to work on the next in the future, how we can engage men uh, because the 90% of the decision making at the home is based on a man in Somali community. So this is what we really want to I think, do. I think we need to name it. It's called the patriarchal system. And that's the system we are all fighting all together. I think now they are understanding they stood the harmful practice. Mm. They speak about it, but we really need to, to make them to make that more feasible in the community. Thank you. I, I'm very aware we've got little time, but I think what we wanna I would like to hear actually because all of us, but I think from the I would say our three heroes on this call are the, our frontline activists. Maybe if you could say one thing you would want from us, because sometimes usually in these conversations, like us telling you, this is what you need. But if there was one thing each one of you would want from us who are, who want to support you through all this, you know, because you know, you are, and we're not physically there, but you are not alone. I think this is why these conversations have to constantly continue at a political level, at a policy level, at a community level. So maybe Natalie, I'll start with you. Um, what would you want from us? Can you hear us, Natalie? Um, it's right. Um, thank you, Leila. Yep. 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 Yes, I can. Um, I think what I just wanted to add on, on what Dr. Mariam had said, uh, just before sharing my perspective is that one of the things uh, i think i also saw in, in in kenya was how young people came together for mm -hmm. instance we had um we had when 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 west pokot girls were being cut in mass we saw <clears throat> young people rallying behind behind um you know the girls in west pokot and calling for action and calling out you know calling for support and saying that we need to get girls out and we saw information being shared we also saw the NFGM podcast that was giving um up to date, like up to date uh, responses or uh, insights into what was happening across the community. And for me, that's one of the ways that um, you know young young people or frontline activists have been able to work around Kenya. And one of the things that I, you know, how how would want you to help us is that um, want you to continue to listen to what is working in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, within the Korea community, one of the people who holds a very big uh, decision. In terms of who, who when, where, whether girls get, whether a girl gets cut or not, are the women and the mothers, mm -hmm. and that could be different somewhere else. So I think one of the things mm -hmm. we need to do is listen. You yeah. need to listen Excellent. to the frontline activists. You need mm -hmm. to listen to the girls. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to listen to, um, you know, in in other cases, uh, the 
the, you know, the, the medical practitioners and what evidence they have to say. And another thing we need to move, uh, and I know this is a song that has been sung and it's about time we put, we put money where our mouth is. We need to support grassroots activists. Yes. We need to take resources there. We need to take, we need to take ourselves there and actually see what is happening and build up on evidence. Some of the communities don't even have data. We need to be able to support for data to be done. And another thing also, um, just to just to add, um, some of the FGM doesn't happen in isolation. There's so many other things that contribute mm -hmm. to it. That's another thing we also need to identify that and and join and support. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. If you can ask briefly Fatumata for yeah, and keep it very sure. brief as well. Thank you. Yeah. So Fatumata, donc la question. C'est qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire nous, les gens qui sont réunis ici et puis la communauté euh, internationale, pour vous soutenir, vous, pour vous épauler dans votre euh, engagement Est-ce qu'il y a une chose qu'on peut faire We can't hear you. Oh. Unmute yourself. Dans le micro. Yes. Merci. Oh non. She's. Can someone uh, just? Can we unmute her? You know, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, please. Oh, we've got to love technology. Technology will be on our side very soon. Yes, go ahead, Fatfata. Vas-y, vas-y. C'est bon? Yep. C'est bon. OK. Um, en fait, c'est une très bonne question. Parce que um, nous, on a besoin de votre soutien. Ici, par exemple, je crois que Léla a dit quelque chose lorsqu'on avait fait euh, les, les, les photos, l'impact que ça, ça a eu au niveau communautaire. Parce que ça montre à tout le monde qu'il y a des gens qui sont là qui ne veulent pas de cette pratique. Moi, je crois que vous, à votre niveau, vous devez essayer encore d'accompagner les, 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 les jeunes parce qu'ils ont besoin de ça. Surtout les former, les formations. Parce que euh, ce n'est pas facile. Euh, L'exclusion, c'est un euh, sujet très tabou. Donc, nous, les activistes, et surtout nous, les, les victimes de cette pratique-là, c'est à nous de, 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 de parler. pas facile. Parce que moi, je ne peux pas donner égal au Kenya pour euh, essayer de parler. Avec quel moyen Je ne peux pas, mais avec, euh, accom avec votre accompagnement, essayez de mettre en place quelque chose de solide pour qu'on puisse partager, nous, par exemple, euh, ce qu'on subit ici, et aussi partager avec les Kenyans, parce que j'y étais une fois, j'ai vu que l'exclusion, euh, ça se pratique beaucoup là-bas. Eux aussi, qu'est-ce qu'elles qu qu font pour essayer de dissuader ces, ces, ces pratiquants Donc, c'est euh, très bien d'essayer de, 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 les, de, les, de, les, de, les, de les partager notre expérience. Cette partage d'expérience, c'est très bien. Okay. Maintenant, comment on peut faire Quelle Alors, coalition mener Pardon, excuse-moi, je t'ai coupé. Mm -hmm. C'est bon mm -hmm. OK. Alors, en gros, so, basically, um, uh, Fatoumata says uh, that FGMC is still very taboo and the most important thing is to talk about it and to create those opportunities to talk about it, and especially with young people, um, and sort of to remove um, all the taboo. So uh, Leila, she was referring to the photography exhibition. Ah, um, the face of compliance. Think... Yeah, that's how I met Fatimata years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So she, yeah. basically, she was saying sorry, that, um, that that was one way of showing the sort of human face, yeah. I guess, of FGMC yeah. and getting people to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And she also mentioned um, activists from different countries and um, sharing mm -hmm. their experiences. She has already met um, activists in Kenya and she says it's really important for them to just discuss, especially yeah. survivors, share their experience, their outlook and learn from each other. That's a very unsophisticated summary of what she said. Thank, Thank you so Thank much, Fatumata. For those Thank who you. don't know, uh, Face of Defiance was one of the 
projects that came out of the girl generation because I'm a survivor myself and I was sick and tired of the media constantly portraying us as these ugly broken women and we managed to get uh, a photography project where we it was black and white portraits of, of, of FGM survivors or activists who really broke the cycle and we wanted to tell with beautiful stories and non-edited stories and three three of them are now part of the National Portrait Gallery collection so you know, it's, it, it, it was really impactful. And, and one of the chapters we did was Senegal. So that's how I met Fatimata a couple of years ago. Thank you so much, Fatimata. Um, uh, Mariam, what do you need from us is the question. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can we have it on lot. recording. We can always go back to this. <laughs> yeah, let me think. So I think, I, yeah, I, think I, I agree with Natalie that FGM is not happening alone, only in one way. But we have uh, many things that also burden our girls, like the menstrual hygiene. In Somaliland, it's very, it's very expensive, and girls are not even reaching. So it's, we have a very menstrual poverty or period poverty that is also huge. So one of the things actually we need, we don't need FGM as a vertical program. We need a holistic program, integrated. And that we can speak about FGM, menstrual hygiene, STBV, education, health, health, and all of that. And sometimes we speak about FGM as awareness raising, and we speak about the complications without putting the, how we can treat. So sometimes when I'm speaking to the woman about the complication, and they look at me because already they are living with this. And we need, we really need to speak about how they can survive with these complications. And all that kind of a product is that can support the woman to survive. It need to be integrated with the projects. So actually, we, we when we really need to uh, to design the project is an FGM and um, and FGM programs. We really need to have integrated as a, as an holistic activists also live with the torrent and also trauma. Sometimes you receive a message that also depresses you, threatens you to death, and all of that. So we really need also um, psychotherapists for, for activists and we need a platform to speak together and speak to each other. Ac the, the last thing is to support the grassroots. Actually, if we put this kind of a funding to the NGO, it will not come like the way an activist do. So activists always, it is from their hearts. So maybe we can also uh, adopt flexible funding for the activists that they can not reach out. If I need to jump now and I hear some community that are, are practicing FGM, I need something that to support me to go there at least. So, and the other thing we really need to, to learn from our past, from the NGO is how they were doing the things. And maybe we can implement and have a, a different, a different programs that can support and that can benefit the community as whole and not seeing it as a from external, but also from internal that we are enriched and, and create a lot of activists inside the community. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mariam. So just to kind of round up what was what we are, what you guys are asking, you're asking one, I think frontline activists need to be seen as actual experts in this work. They are experts, better resource projects, incorporating it with a holistic approach political commitment, but most importantly, to be heard. Listen, listen, listen. I, I, I'm hearing that and I want to let you know, me and my team are, are listening. We will make sure FCDO is listening. <laughs> so that's really important. So we have five more minutes. Maybe I'll ask Nancy again, maybe read some of the comments uh, from, from, from the chat and then we will close this session. And thank you so much. So Nancy, over to you, maybe one or two comments you want to read out? Yeah. Um, I think sure. our panelists need to hear how great they are. I think it's important. <laughs> so um, we have a number of comments. Uh, the first one I'm going to read says, they don't have words to express how inspiring your actions are. Your words and commitments give me hope. I'm a 25 year old PhD student in the UK. And when I learned about FGM, I fainted. Um, so that's just part of the, uh, um, comment there, he says it's very inspirational what you're doing. Uh, another comment says brilliant examples from the frontline activists demonstrating resilience 
uh, during the current crisis. And then I'll just take two questions. The first one I think has been tackled, uh, but we'll see if um, the minister can also reinforce on this. Mm -hmm. How can frontline activists be supported by FCDO and how can they be supported by the public? Question one and question two says, is the government uh, going to link this excellent work uh, being done in the UK with the work in the high prevalence countries um, and just mentions a few of those. So um, is the government going to- Can I, uh, can I make a suggestion? We, we don't have enough time, but we'll answer the first one on how FCTO will respond. Uh, how, will, how will you support activists? Thank you, Leila. That's a no, re really good question. And I think when, when I, the first thing that, on the first things I said today was that I was very much here to listen to uh, everybody's comments. And um, that is one of the most important things for me is to really listen to to what you're what you're saying and to what what you're telling me from the front line as 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 activists. So I that's one of my big takeaways from from here. And I I actually feel. Uh, very inspired by what I've been hearing and by your determination uh, to work together to tackle to tackle this this issue. Um, you know, we we are very proud of the role that the UK has played to support um, the Africa-led movement and, and accelerate the, 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 the pace of change. And as you know, Leila, we're a staunch defender of sexual and reproductive health and rights. And you know, we've we've not been afraid to stand up and speak out when these rights are being abused. And I think it's in, that's an important role that, that we, that we have, to have to play in supporting the work that you do um, at the grassroots and on the front line. Thank you so much for that, uh, Wendy. Also, if you are someone with a particular expertise on this call who would really like to vote, because I'm speaking as an activist myself, we always need volunteers to help you navigate this works. So if you want to gain good experience, I'm sure Natalie, Mariam and Fatumata would really appreciate if you can come and give some support to their work, because it's really difficult when you're trying to protect somebody from violence and then you have to do admin work or respond to even an email. So I know from my experience, having that kind of support really had an impact on how I did this work. So uh, we have come to the end of our webinar. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our partners at the consortium for joining us today and helping us uh, put this together. A big thank you to FCDO's team for really supporting us through this. Uh, a big thank you to Wendy for joining us. I know this is a very busy time, but a massive, massive thank you to the, the three experts that's I'm going to name them now. The three experts who are the front lines fighting this every day, Dr. Mariam, Natalie, Fatumata, thank you so much. This You really made this conversation to actually what it is. And, and I can see some of the comments, you know, you guys have given us so many ideas on how this should be tackled. Uh, a massive thank you to Atima ALM, uh, Nancy and Jess for really helping put this together and Rachel for uh, doing a brilliant interpretation for us today. Uh, so I don't know, I, I, I find it really strange to say to people happy zero tolerance today, you know, this will end, there is hope. Uh, mm -hmm. We are the examples of that hope. I have an 18 year old daughter who's not cut. Uh, so that's always the hope. It can happen, it will happen. And thank you all for joining us. And hopefully, I'm sure we're gonna see each other on other webinars in the next couple of days. Please take care of yourself, be very kind, and let's continue to listen. Thank you all so much. Thank you, bye. Bye.